As we continue our focus on the core values of our church, we look at the value of hope this morning, and our core values are those foundational principles, are the the Christ-like qualities that enable us to live lives that are consistent with what we say we believe. Hope, like the other five here in this series, is an essential. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that what you have for us is better than what we have for ourselves. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. <clears throat> I want to begin with a word association exercise. Now if I say the word pizza, what comes to mind? <laughs> Cheese, uh... <laughs> If it's food, well, it usually gets my attention. Um, How about if I say lilac? What comes to mind? Now, how about hope? I would think many of us would say wish. If we were to look at a dictionary definition, we might read something like this. Uh, The feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out well. Well, that definition seems a a bit limited to me. Uh, Biblical hope is much more than a feeling that things will turn out okay. In fact, it's much deeper than how we feel or even what we want. King David stated in Psalm 78, verses 4 through 7, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he has issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles or obeying his commands. Biblical hope is grounded in the reality and the knowledge of what God has already accomplished. And that is exactly the focus this morning. I'm not sure that I've shared this story, but I've learned the extreme value of hope firsthand. About 12 years ago, I had had an experience that... It was, it was a life change, but it didn't seem so at the moment. I was in my fifth year as an automotive technician, second year working on the blue team at a Dodge Nissan Daewoo dealer in Allentown. I'd stopped going to church a few years before then, but started going back a couple months prior to that. And From my years as a mechanic, well, I had to have surgery on my hand because I tore some ligaments in the thumb on my right hand, so that would mean that I would be out of work for a few months, especially since I had to wear a cast to immobilize my thumb. Well, the youth pastor at the church, my my home church, he offered me the opportunity to do security at the district youth camp, so I, you know, he knew that I wouldn't be doing a whole lot, so I took him up on that offer and Through that experience, God had placed within me a desire for something much deeper than simply making money by fixing cars. From that experience, I knew I couldn't go back to work and simply couldn't be complacent with my life. And when I had returned to work, I was greatly disappointed because I got a small taste of something much greater, leaving me with this unsettled feeling I, I just couldn't get rid of. I couldn't shake it. So after a lot of thinking and praying and discussing, I knew I had to move on to something else, toward finding a peace, to get rid of that unsettled feeling. And that meant going to college, getting a degree in ministry, and saying goodbye to my life as a technician. That was only the beginning, though. It seems silly to leave a secure job, making money, to spending a lot of money that I won't see for a long time, if ever. But I knew that to go back to my ordinary life, I wouldn't be happy, because God had something far better in store for me. So I lived in the hope that what God had for me was 
was much greater than the plans I had for my own life. <clears throat> now, many people wouldn't make a career shift like that because it's, it really is difficult to see beyond present circumstances. There will be so many troubles that arise in our lives, and if we can't see past them to see what God has in store, we truly are hopeless. But we of all people have a reason to hope, and God commands us <clears throat> to pass that hope on to the next generation. Paul writes in his letter to the Roman believers, chapter 15, or I think it's 15, in verse, <laughs> chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of sharing the glory of God. Not only that, but also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The New Living Translation actually says, instead of hope, it says, confident expectation of salvation. Salvation isn't just from something, it's for something. None of us can look back at what God has done in, through, for, and to our lives and remain without hope for our future. We serve an amazing God. Paul defines for us a reason for that hope, and that reason is, one, <clears throat> in Christ we can live with no condemnation. That means we are forgiven and set free. Romans 8, verses 1 through 2 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. That's the first reason for hope. When we give our lives to Christ, God has forgiven us for everything we've ever done wrong. That doesn't mean we won't make mistakes or that we won't sin. It means pardon for our failures is still available. God's not looking to punish us. He's not a cosmic scorekeeper watching every time we screw up and laughing at us. In receiving pardon, Paul says the offense is gone. Or the, the offense isn't gone, but the penalty is gone. The penalty is removed. No condemnation means we've been set free from our past. In other words, we have the power to break free from the things that control us, the fear of death, the need for approval from others, the worries of today, guilt, resentment, bitterness, loneliness, boredom, complacency, habits, hurts, and hang-ups that hold us back. God's hope, his confident expectation means that God can enable us to change and to break the grip of sin in our lives. Romans 8.3 states, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his only son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. <clears throat> Paul says that when Jesus died on the cross, he not only removed the penalty of sin, he broke its power, making us free from its authority. Now, if I trust Jesus, I now have the power to make the changes in my life that I never knew were possible. Ask any believer who is in recovery. They know it very well. So the first reason for our hope is that in Christ we live with no condemnation. We no longer are condemned to live in the past, but that we are forgiven and free. The second reason for our hope is that too, in Christ, we have life with no termination, meaning we will live forever. That means that death in this life is not the end, but the beginning. One day... Your heart will stop beating. That will be the end of your body, but that's not the end of you. You were created in the image of God. 
You were created to live eternally. This life is a mere shadowy glimpse into what God had originally created us for. A glimpse, as you know, is not the full picture, but a momentary taste of the bigger picture. Now take a moment and remember some of the greatest experiences or the greatest feelings that you've ever had. Now multiply that by the depths of infinity and you still won't be able to process a life with no more sadness, no more sorrow, sickness, suffering, or any other S descriptive word you can insert. Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Just as Jesus rose from the grave, one day God is going to resurrect us. When we die, if we've put our trust in Christ, we will be in heaven with him. And later we will have a new body. And I'm not sure about you, but I really am looking forward to that day. Hope, that confident expectation, truly makes a difference in a person's life. Regardless of problems we face, that hope tells us that this isn't all that there is to life. If you really want a good example of that, compare a Christian funeral to a non-Christian funeral. The difference is so obvious, you wouldn't need to study it very long. When a friend or family member dies, it is essentially the litmus test for what they believe. Maybe you've seen fear and terror in their eyes. Maybe you've heard resignation in their voice saying, this is all I have, or it's over, or this is all there is to this life. A believer knows this is not leaving home, but going home. Making a funeral more of a celebration than a commiseration. In Christ, we have no condemnation. We're forgiven, set free. And we can start becoming new and better people here in this life, knowing that this isn't all. And we have eternity with God to look forward to. The third reason, in Christ, we're able to live a life with no limitation. Meaning that we will share in God's glory. Not only will we live forever, but when we arrive home in heaven, We will have unlimited access to all of God's resources. Romans 8, chapter uh, chapter 8, verses 16, in the first half of 17, tells us that as children of God, we have an inheritance coming to us. So let's look at this. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ... We are heirs of God's glory. I find that to be one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. Everything that God has given his Son, he's given to us as well, with no limitation. When we make a decision in this life to give our lives to Christ, the Bible tells us we're going to share in his glory. In heaven, we will have unlimited access to the unlimited resources of God because we are now his children. You see, everyone is created by God, but not everyone is a child of God. Many people don't choose to say, Lord, I put my trust in you. I accept what you did for me on the cross. I believe you and I want to love and trust you. When we do that, we become children of God. We're going to have an inheritance one day. Everything that's given to Jesus will be given to us. Jesus taught that God watches to see what we do with what he's already given us in this life. To see if we will be responsible enough to get greater talents in heaven. God has already entrusted us with things. He he wants to see how we do with a little bit of wealth or the little bit of relationships 
or the little bit of opportunities he's given to us here. If we do well here with what he's given us, guess what? The Bible tells us we will be, with, we will be entrusted with more in heaven. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. That's Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus also tells us in Luke 16, 10, if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. <clears throat> the true question is, what are we doing here with what we've already been given? <clears throat> How do we respond to problems? Do we take them to God or do we try to solve them ourselves? How do we respond to pressure? Do we take it to God or do we try to handle it ourselves? How do we handle pain? Do we gripe and complain or do we take it to God? How we handle suffering and sorrow, they, these are all part of life's test. Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18 says, And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. <clears throat> no condemnation. No termination, life with no limitation. Three great reasons to have hope. And the last reason mentioned this morning is that in Christ there is no separation. Meaning we will always be loved. That those who are in Christ will never be separated from God. We will always be loved. Nothing we can do will separate us from God's love. Did you hear that? We will always be loved, and nothing we can do can separate us from God's love. Only our own unwillingness to give our lives to him. Nothing other than ourselves can destroy our relationship with God. If you grasp that fact, if you understand that, it does, and it will change your life. In Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul tells us, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we put our hand in God's, he grasps it. And he doesn't let go. There may be times we might like to let go, but he will never let go. We are forever secure unless we let go of his hand. If I have put my trust in Christ, he says nothing will separate me from the love of God. Doesn't mean we have diplomatic immunity. It means that only we surrender our salvation by turning our backs on him. Jude, verse 24, tells us he is able to keep you from falling. On our own, we're going to fail in life. But God is able to keep us from falling. We will not fall out of his grace. We have to jump out of it. No matter what we face in life, we don't face it alone. We will not face it alone. Reason number four, in Christ there is no separation from God's love and purpose. Hope is the core value that enables us to respond to those tough places in life. Living with the confident expectation of salvation and eternity changes how we handle the difficulties in life. How we respond to the ups and downs of this life depends on the source of our hope, our confident expectation of our eternal future. 
Living with that confident expectation means we are forgiven and free. There is no condemnation. We will live forever. There is no termination. We will share in God's glory with no limitation. We will always be loved. There is no separation. So what does hope do? Our hope enables us to look for the good in people instead of harping on the worst. It opens doors where despair closes them. You can discover what can be done instead of grumbling about what can't. We can draw strength from a deep trust in God. We can light a candle instead of cursing the darkness. And most importantly, we can overcome the disappointments in this life. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8, But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Whatever we face, we need to live in this life with the confident expectation of the future God has planned for us. Our hope enables us to live beyond disappointment, and trust me, life will be full of disappointments. Regardless of what we faith, what we faith, what we face, we live in confident expectation of eternity, knowing that this life is not it. There's more to it. And we can know that nothing is hopeless in the presence of God. Knowing that, let me ask, how will you increase your hope? How will you increase your hope? Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you this morning that you are the source of our hope. You are the source of our life. You are the reason we live and breathe. You're You're the reason that that we have anything. Father, we pray that we don't lose sight of hope. We don't We don't put our hope and our trust in things of this world, but that we put our hope in you, that you will bring to completion the work that you've already started, and that we can always hope. We can have our hope in the knowledge of what you've done in the past has been completed through Jesus Christ. So we pray this morning that you renew within us a sense of hope, a sense of peace, your presence in our lives, <clears throat> the assurance of, of our salvation, the assurance of your love for us. And we pray that, <clears throat> like what David said, we can be the ones that pass that hope on to the world around us, to the next generation, so on and so forth, that we remember the mighty good deeds that you've done, the the good works that you've already accomplished. We remember that. We celebrate those things. Father, that gives us hope for tomorrow. Now we pray all this in the name of Jesus who gives us that.